Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, Jeremiah, he whom God launches forth, chapter 38. We're going to get to it here in verse 1 in a moment. Remember, Jeremiah, having been chosen by our Father to bring us a message both historically and future. Future is the king of Babylon coming to Jerusalem as the spurious Messiah. There is no excuse for not knowing the truth, basically, of how things are going to go down. God would probably put this chapter in to let you know, <clears throat> excuse me, I take care of my people. I know what's going on. You can count on me. Call on me. Talk to me. So, chapter 38, verse 1. Then Shephathiah, that's to say, judged of Yah, the son of Matan, and Gedaliah, the son of Pasher, um, freedom, and Jukal, the son of Shelemiah, and Pasher, the son of Malchiah, heard the words of, that Jeremiah had spoken unto all the people, saying, verse 2, Thus saith the Lord, He that remaineth in this city shall die by the sword. But the, by the famine, and by the pestilence, but he that goeth forth to the Chaldeans shall live. For he shall have his life for a prey, that means as a gift, and shall live. That's the way our Father operates, okay? He's got a plan. What, what is he telling you today in the future? He said, King of Babylon is coming. You have, you have an obligation to be delivered up to him whereby the Holy Spirit can speak through you. Now, if you fight him or run away from him, you're disobeying every commandment of God. You're not listening to your father. And certainly, um, it's a lot easier to be blessed than cursed. Okay? Well, how, what do you mean cursed? Well, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5, what did it say? Cursed be the man that puts his faith in man and not in God. Okay? Verse 3, Thus saith the Lord, This city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. It's going to happen. And you can rest assured that before, when, when uh, Satan, as the Antichrist, is kicked out of heaven, the very first thing he's going to do is take Jerusalem. You might say, well, where, where can you document that in God's word? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul, I mean, he gives it to you play by play. Verse 4. Therefore the princes said unto the king, We beseech thee, let this man be put to death, speaking of Jeremiah. For thus he weakeneth the hands of the men of war that remain in this city, and the hands of all the people, he, in speaking such words unto them. For this man seeketh not the welfare of this people, but the hurt. <clears throat> there again, these people are putting their trust in man and man's ability to war instead of what God has said. I think they pretty well all knew that Jeremiah was a prophet of God, but they are questioning the prophet even to the point of saying, hey, kill him, put him to death. His, it, this prophecy will weaken them where they won't want to fight because it says you give up or you go with them, follow their orders. Now, Daniel and uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are already in captivity. What happened to them? What did Nebuchadnezzar do to them that is so terrible? He sent them to college. He sent, I mean, the highest learning in the land. He taught them. And... Um, <clears throat> was not unkind to them, let them pick their own food, and, and so it was. 
that God, of course, having called Nebuchadnezzar his servant, and certainly even this may upset some, but God has a plan to allow the Antichrist to come and see if you've done your homework. It, it, is, it is a test to see if you can recognize the enemy from the letter he has written you, giving you every warning whereby you know exactly what you should do to stand against him. Not by the power of the arm, but by the Holy Spirit speaking through you. Verse 5. Then Zedekiah the king said, Behold, he is in your hand, for the king is, is uh, not he that can do anything against you. He, he was a weakling. I mean, uh, you talk about a wet noodle. He couldn't make a stand for anything. He was one sorry king. Verse 6. Then took uh, they Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of, of Malchiah, the son of Hamalek, that's the king's servant, that was in the court of the prison. And they let, him, they let down Jeremiah with cords. And in the dungeon, there was no water. Actually, it was an old cistern. But mire, so Jeremiah sank in the mire. Now, he has these cords under his arm. They will cut. Okay. Very uncomfortable. And he's hanging and dangling by these cords, not being fed. Um, he's going to die if somebody doesn't do something. And naturally, I suppose this is where you get your acid test as to whether you trust God or not. I mean, God sent Jeremiah there. God told Jeremiah what to say, and Jeremiah said it, even knowing that he would be very unpopular for telling the truth. But he stuck with it. He was not a wimp. And he, he brought forth God's word exactly as it's written. But do you know something? When you trust God, God can use whomever he wants to to see that his, his will is done. Watch this and watch it closely. Verse 7. Now when Ebedmelech, the Ethiopian, this is not even an Israelite, it's a servant of the king. That's what Ebed Melech. Melech is king, and this is a servant of the king. One of the eunuchs, which was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon, the king then setting in the gate of Benjamin, like, um, I mean, doing nothing. And here, this Ethiopian, not even an Israelite, God touches, he has compassion. God will use whomever he wishes to accomplish what must be accomplished. Verse 8. Ebedmelech went forth out of the king's house and spake to the king, saying, he certainly wasn't afraid. Okay. Verse 9. My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeon. And he is like to die for hunger in the place where he is. For there is no more bread in the city. He's going to die there. And that lets you know that the siege is pretty tight and the famine has already begun. Verse 10, And then the king commanded Ebedelech, the Ethiopian, saying, Take from hence... 30 men with thee and take up Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he die. Here, here a Gentile had to speak up to the head Israelite to get God's work and God's command scotched, that is to say fixed, whereby it would come to pass as it was written. Uh, and I'm not taking away from God's control because God had his hand on this Gentile and caused him to do this. He was not afraid. Why? Because he, he loved the Lord. And the Lord takes care of those that love him. So the Gentile speaks out for the benefit of Jeremiah. 
Verse 11, so Ebed-Melech took the men with him, 30 is the same number as the pieces of silver that buy a slave, okay, and went into the house of the king under the treasury and took thence old cast cloths and old rotten rags and let them down by cords into the dungeon to Jeremiah. Now, here, here again shows you compassion. He knows those cords are cutting under his armpits. So he sends down this old clothing and cloths of clothing, waist cloth, so that he can pad under his arms where the cords won't cut when they pull him out. Again, that's compassion, led of God to deliver this man. I don't know, uh, would you say this is testing the faith of Jeremiah? Uh, Jeremiah uh, did not deserve testing. He, he would never doubt. But a lot of people would by this time. They would be screaming out. But not a servant of the living God. Verse 12, to continue. And Ebedmelech, the Ethiopian, the Gentile said unto Jeremiah, Put now these old cast cloths and rotten rags under thine armholes, that's to say your armpits, under the cords, and Jeremiah did so. You, you pad this up, we're going to pull you out. And, and within that, I want you to know you can see compassion. He really felt for Jeremiah, knowing what Jeremiah was experiencing. And he was taking care of that man of God. Verse 13, So they drew up Jeremiah with cords and took him up out of the dungeon, and Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. Um, Yahweh blessed him. God always takes care of his own. You know, in, in this is why that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, it states very clearly there to a servant of God. God will never have anything happen to you that isn't pretty normal with everybody. Something Everybody has to go through it. But he, he will never test you beyond what you can cut, what you can handle. And the main thing is he will always show you a way out. And when you have the faith to know that, it gives you stability. It gives you a platform. It gives you level ground to stand on to serve the living God. And certainly uh, Jeremiah, blessed from where many wished him to die because of the prophecy of the living God. But God sent that Gentile. And that Gentile, having power with the king, brought forth this one. 14. Then Zedekiah the king sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him into the third entry that is in the house of the Lord. And the king said unto Jeremiah, I will ask thee a thing, hide nothing from me. Now, I mean, they've already threatened to kill him. Does he tell the truth or what does he do here? Verse 15, And then Jeremiah said unto Zedekiah, If I declare it unto thee, Wilt thou not surely put me to death? Question. And if I give thee counsel, wilt thou not hearken unto me? If I tell you, you're not going to listen to me. Well, Jeremiah is saying, what, what am I doing? Wasting my time? <clears throat> 16. So Zedekiah the king swears secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord liveth, that made us this soul, I will not put thee to death. Neither will I give thee into the hand of these men that seek thy life. I, I will protect you. I swear that to, by the living God. <clears throat> 17. Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, If thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's uh, princes, then thy soul shall live. And this city shall not be burned with fire, and thou shalt live in thine house. If you will just go according to God's plan, 
You're, you're going to be just as safe as you can be. Again, I would remind you, what about Daniel? He's going to college, eating well, being fed well by Nebuchadnezzar. And God will even appoint another Gentile named Cyrus to deliver the people from Nebuchadnezzar and rebuild Jerusalem. God uses whomever he will, but he has a plan and it has a purpose. And you must always follow that plan of God because it is for a very, always for a very good reason. It's the salvation of his people. Verse 18. But if thou wilt not go forth to the king of Babylon's princes, then shall this city be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, and they shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand. End of story. That's the way it's going to be. You can count on it. Verse 19. And Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah, I'm afraid of the Jews, that's to say the Judeans, that are fallen to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hand, and they mock me. Now, do you think for a moment Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, that they would mock Zedekiah? Of course they wouldn't have. Hey, what would Daniel do? Daniel would even raise up to be a ruler basically over Babylon, even the main tax collector, providing um, welfare for the people there. And here Zedekiah is afraid he's going to be mocked. That's, um, that's self-pride. Self-pride can cause you to make so many wrong de decisions because many people, they dread being mocked. But I'm going to tell you a time that you don't have to worry about dreading mockery or anything else. That's to say, when you do God's word. It doesn't matter. When you do God's word and God's wishes, it doesn't matter what man might think. It's what God thinks, because God will take care of the man. That's, that's no problem at all for our Heavenly Father. God always protects his own. You saw an example of that. I mean, Jeremiah, he, he's, he's a dead man walking. He's, he's down in an old cistern, and he sinks more into that mire every day. No food. And God sent a Gentile. God always takes care of his own. You can rest assured of that. Verse 20. But Jeremiah said, They shall not deliver thee. They're not going to mock you. Obey, I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord, which I speak unto thee, so it shall be well unto thee, and thy soul shall live. You're not going to die. It's the will of God. Verse 21. But if thou refuse to go forth, this is the word that the Lord has showed me. 22. This is it. And behold, all the women that are left in the king of Judah's house shall be brought forth to the king of Babylon's princes. And those women shall say, Thy friends have set thee on. The, the Egyptians have really played you good and have prevailed against thee. Thy feet are sunk in the mire, and they have turned away back. The, the, the Pharaoh's army ran like a bunch of scared dogs. And, and uh, here you allow us to be taken. In other words, it's Zedekiah's own family that will mock him. Not the children that have already obeyed God and have been taken captive. 23. So they shall bring all thy wives and thy children to the um, Chaldeans, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand, but shall be taken by the hand of the king of Babylon, and thou shalt cause this city to be burned with fire. That's exactly how it will go down. If you disobey the word of God. You know, when, when you um, know that you're going against Father's plan, friend, you're asking for bad trouble. And what is this literally building up to in the futurist sense, prophetically speaking? King of Babylon's coming. God has a purpose in you being delivered up. Why? 
Well, Mark 13, so the world can hear the truth spoken through your lips by the Holy Spirit. That, that is essential that that word be heard all the way around the world before the end comes. It's God's plan. And I'll tell you something else. That is exactly how it shall happen. You could, well, how do you know that for sure? Because God said it. It is written in the story. You can count on it. So this is what it's saying. It's going to happen. You're either, either you're going along with it. And quite frankly, if you're one of God's elect and if you refuse the Holy Spirit, that just happens to be the unpardonable sin. That, it doesn't get any more serious than that. So you need to pay attention to your father, to his word, and to his wishes. Next verse, please, 24. Then said Zedekiah unto Jeremiah, Let no man know of these words, and thou shalt not die. He's wimping out again. He said, don't, don't you let any of my people know that I asked and talked to you about this. 25. But, if the prince is here that I have talked with thee, and they come unto thee and say unto thee, Declare unto us now what thou hast said unto the king. Hide it not from us, and we will not put thee to death. Also what the king said unto thee. Want to know. little gossip going on here. And... Um, saying to Jeremiah, you, you um, don't turn on me. Okay. What is he supposed to do? Verse 26. Then thou shalt say unto them, I presented my supplications before the king that he would not cause me to return to Jonathan's house to die there. In other words, you'll cop out, you just say that, that's it. And... Uh, um, no, it's partly true, but uh, not the full truth. 27, then came all the princes unto Jeremiah, here they come, and asked him, and he told them according to all these words that the king had commanded. So they left off speaking with him, for the matter was not perceived. In other words, it, the, the point was left uh, mute. And um, 28, so Jeremiah abode in the court of the prison until the day that Jerusalem was taken. And he was there when Jerusalem was taken. Now, again, I mean, it would look like he was in very bad shape. He's not. Why? Well, God sent him. He's a servant of God. And God always, I do mean always, takes care of his own. So Jeremiah is not in the least bit um, uh, of a problem, and he's not worried. Because just as God sent that Gentile, that Ethiopian, to deliver him, he, he knows that again, that um, the king will see that he, is, the king Nebuchadnezzar even, will see that he is well taken care of. And of course, you, you know from history what happened here all the sons of Zedekiah are going to die. Zedekiah himself will have his eyes gouged out, and he will die. There will be none of the king line left of the tribe of Judah except for the daughters. And Jeremiah himself will be given those daughters. They will go to Egypt. And uh, there, there has even been a building found with the chiseled mark, the, the daughters of Judah where Jeremiah took them in Egypt and then later on to Europe. So uh, God always in control because there would always be one of Judah on that throne until he who would return, who rightfully it belonged to, which is to say Christ, should return and sit on it himself. Chapter 39, verse 1. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, a little time going on here, in the Tenth month, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army against Jerusalem, and they besieged it. Verse 2, and in the eleventh year of Zedekiah, 
and a couple of years down the road, in the fourth month and the ninth day of the month, the city was broken up. He took it good, big time. Verse 3, And all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate. Even Nergalshazar, Sam uh, Garnibo, uh, Sarshikin, uh, Rabsharish, and Nergalshazar, Rebmeg, uh, he was the magician, with all the residue of the princes of the king of Babylon. I mean, they took her, they took her, and there they are in the gate. Do you know what it means when you're in the gate? That's where the judgment takes place. They're going to judge what will happen here. Verse 4, And it came to pass that when Zedekiah the king of Judah saw them, and all the men of war, then they fled, ran like a rabbit, and went forth out of the city by night, by the way of the king's garden, by the gate betwixt the two walls, and he went out the way of the plain. I mean, he was making tracks, he was selling out left his people, left the town, and like I told you, he's kind of a wet noodle. Uh, what's the, you know, how much more noble would it have been to have surrendered as God asked him to than it is to run like a rabbit? There's certainly no honor in that. Verse 5, But the Chaldeans' army pursued after them, and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had taken him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Riblah in the land of Hamath, where he gave judgment upon him. He passed sentence. Hamath being the place where the Kenites, you know, joined um, Israel. Verse 6. Then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah in Riblah, killed every one of them before his eyes. Also the king of Babylon slew all the nobles of Judah. I mean, he cleaned house. Why? They ran. I mean, they would not obey. He had made a pledge to protect them and let them stay in Jerusalem and rule there. But they, they hanky-panky and call in Pharaoh and make war after they made a covenant with Nebuchadnezzar, they would have been plenty safe if they had just kept their word to the king of Babylon. But oh no, they had to lean on Pharaoh. Cursed be the man that trusts in man instead of Almighty God. So that's the reward thereof. They're all dead. Verse 7. Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes. They were gouged out and bound him with chains to carry him to Babylon. And he was worried about being mocked. And he brings this upon his own head. If he had only listened to the prophet of God, he could have had honor. He could have saved his family. But, oh no, he did not listen to God, which Jeremiah was speaking the word of God. He went against him, and like a coward, he ran. A brave man dies once, a coward dies a thousand deaths. So as he in chains, with his eyes gouged out, no doubt much pain, and he's being dragged to Babylon. And mocked, I guess. And, and so it is. Next verse, please. Verse 8. And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the houses of the people with fire and break down the walls of Jerusalem, just exactly as God said it would happen if he didn't obey. Verse 9, Then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive into Babylon the remnant of the people that remained in the city, and those that fell away, that's to say those that ran, they, the deserters, they fell, that fell to him with the rest of the people that remained. Verse 10, But Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left of the poor of the people, 
which had nothing in the land of Judah and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. Those that obeyed and had nothing and certainly took no part in any of the rest of it. King of Babylon set them up. Let them give them vineyards and a way to live and to be prosperous. And you see, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Zedekiah could have had the same treatment, but oh no. Zedekiah must disobey the living God. Verse 11. Now Nebuchadnezzar, the king of uh, Babylon, gave charge concerning Jeremiah to Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, saying, 12, listen to this, take him and look well to him. You take good care of him. And do him no harm. But do unto him even as he shall say unto you. Whatever he desires, you will do it. This is why that um, Nebuchadnezzar would take those daughters that were left and leave with them. Verse 13. So Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, sent and Nebuchadnezzar, Rabsaurus, and Nergalshazar, Remag, the magician, and all the king of Babylon's princes, 14, even they sent and took Jeremiah out of the court of the prison and committed him unto Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, that he should carry him home so he dwelt among the people. He went back home. Uh, this to show you God always takes care of his own. God always protects his own. Now, and, and um, Jeremiah being loyal to our Heavenly Father right to the letter, when, it even meant, when his life was even being threatened, would he change? No, he would not. Uh, rather than changing and saving his own hide, according to man, he put his trust in God. He kept God's word. Those that put their trust in man were cursed and are no more. It's your choice always. Listen to your heavenly Father. Always follow his command. We have a destiny. It is written and you want to be prepared for that. That's what Jeremiah does. It prepares you in the future sense to face that king of Babylon. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular tapes. How was the what? How and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you've always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. And there we are. Back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. Our Father is the judge, and he does not wish your help for that. He can handle it all by himself. But you do have the right to spiritually discern what you should hear, what you should listen to, what you should take to heart, and what you should call. That is to say, put to the side. That is a gift from God called spiritual discernment. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. It's always a pleasure hearing from you. Now, you got a prayer request, you don't need the number, you don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. All you have to do is talk to him. 
and with thought or word, doesn't matter, orally or silent, he knows and he hears. He created you different than anyone else. Your DNA is different. Why? You're unique. He wanted someone just like you. But he wants you to love him. Let him know that today. Want you, Father, around the globe we come with us. If you need guy, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Karen from South Carolina. Uh, would voting for a candidate that has a different religion doctrine than what you believe be against God? Well, it's a, if it's Judeo-Christian and um, they worship Christ, then certainly um, that makes a difference. You know, I'm going to tell you a little story. You, as you well know, we do many documentaries. We went out to Arizona to a Mormon town. And I'm certainly not a Mormon, and um, I, de I naturally I, I am a student of the Word of God. Period. But in in this um, Mormon town, which we were near Lyman Lake, we were doing this documentary, and we stopped at a grocery store to pick up some supplies for lunch because we were going to be in the field all day, and. When one of the party went in to buy the groceries, when they came back, I got out of the minivan we'd rented, and my wallet fell in the parking lot, unbeknownst to me. And then we all loaded back up, and we got about three or four blocks away, and as you know how you do, I thought something's missing, and sure enough, there was. It was my wallet. There was about $1,200 because we were on a trip in that wallet. And I thought, the only place it could be is it dropped out of my pocket in that parking lot. Well, we turned and immediately went back, and sure enough, it's not in the parking lot. And one of the party went inside and said, we dropped a wallet in the lot, and said, well, whose name was in it? And it was said, and the wallet was handed back, all $1,200 there, and it was brought back out to me. And... I went back in, or had to go back in, and offered a reward. And the word was, no, it would rob my reward from the Lord Jesus Christ. If you gave me a reward also, I prefer his reward. But I, I wonder how many towns, you know, we, we judge religions, and me, my doctorate being in religious education, I have to be familiar with many religions, or I certainly would not have a doctorate within that. And I'm familiar with many religions. And in as much as we are not to judge, I, I would just simply ask you one thing, and I'm not favoring anyone, but just be honest with me and, and tell me this. How many towns in America could you go to today, drop a wallet with 1,200 bucks in it, drive away and leave it in a parking lot and come back and have it safely by the hands of the living God delivered back to you, and no reward accepted. How many towns in America could that happen in? I, I would say, hopefully, I wish it would be a lot of them. But I don't have to answer it for you. So we, we don't judge, but as long as, as, as um, a Christian, it's best if you can vote for a Christian. Otherwise, if it's a man of God, then you judge it accordingly. But... Um, in your spiritual discernment. But um, it's the heart of the man that counts, all right, regardless of who it is. Rose from Tennessee. It, I'm, it would seem there is a move on, I might say at the same time, to destroy Christianity in this nation. And that's why I emphasize Christianity. It seems it gets hit harder than any other religion, even though in some places we're at war against Islam. Islam gets a lot easier ride than Christians do in this nation that was founded by Christians. So we need to tighten our belts a little bit, and you need to pay attention, strictly pay attention. Rose from Tennessee, where can I find the scriptures that speak out how your works determine the linen that you wear in heaven? Thank you. Revelation chapter 19, verse 8 will tell you that the white linen 
beautiful robe that you wear in heaven is woven from the fine linen that is created by your righteous acts, meaning the acts you did that were right. Guess what? If you don't have any acts to weave linen from, you're going to be naked. All right, and that, that would be embarrassing. Would you be mocked? Probably, they probably wouldn't laugh. Hmm, maybe. Uh, Curtis from California. How do you spell eth adam Where can I find this and what does it mean in English? It means the man Adam. But you would have to find it in the Hebrew manuscripts in the, the book of Genesis chapter 2. E-T-H, eth, which, you know, you can take those same letters, E-T-H, and make it T T E, um, make it um, uh, T H E, and you got the. Well, that's what it means, okay? In Hebrew, F. Ha, being and the man Adam. In other words, the one, the one what? The one through which Christ will come. Okay, we got uh, Kathy from Ohio. I am almost shocked right off of my feet at it by a statement a family member said to me, I have to tell you that this family member's father is a retired preacher and they all believe they're going to be raptured out. His statement to me was exactly this, most of the New Testament is against the church. That's a strange statement in as much as Christ is the church and most of the New Testament is for him. I just could not believe my ears all are all of these rapture believers, this, or all of them this far out of it. Will there be hope for them in the millennium even though they have fully jumped onto Satan's rapture boat when he appears? Well, it, it's, it's all according. God has put the spirit of slumber on some as it's written in Revelation 11, and we're not to judge, but everybody will have an equal chance you see, a lot of people can go to right straight to a church in this nation. And you're not going to have God's Word taught there. Maybe, maybe one verse and then taken out of context in some cases. I'm not judging them. But what it means is, is you don't know any better because you're not taught. So therefore, they are ignorant and, and not guilty because of ignorance. And that's why we have the millennium, is to make sure everyone is taught and then Satan's turned loose again. And we, we see what happens then. Bill from Texas. Um, thank you. My wife thinks you're welcome. Um, we uh, thank you so much for your teaching. My wife and I believe with you that there will be no rapture in spite of so many preachers that say it will happen. My wife's asked if there is any historical evidence about the woman, a Mrs. McDonald, who is supposed to have started to believe. Thank you. Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, uh, we have the work, um, the rapture doctrine, rapture theory, uh, that uh, in our library, and it's, it's a historical account, and it will help you. Norman from Illinois. I'm a regular listener. Would you please tell me where in the Bible it says that in the end times your leaders will have the minds of children? Isaiah chapter 3, verse 4, and God promises. He says, in the end time, your, your leaders are going to have the minds of a child. And so that's prophecy. And you know something um, kind of come to pass, doesn't it? Uh, uh, Lorna from, Lorna from uh, California. My husband and I have been students. Thank you. I am... I have, I'm having a discussion with a friend about your teaching. She is a strong Christian woman, although for a rapture theory, from a rapture theory background, but we can discuss differences pleasantly and both have a desire to learn. She believes you are teaching first age existence from born again of woman reincarnation. I know you are not, but I don't have, I don't know how to explain to her why and cannot recall the scripture to prove that point. Also, and this probably has to do with the previous paragraph, I cannot find the scripture that says something about knew you before the foundations of the earth. One scripture talks about knowing you in the womb, but I'm, I'm, 
I, but I want to be able to show her uh, of God knowing us even before that. Well, it's it's real easy. Ephesians, um, Ephesians chapter one verse four will give you the um, fact that God says, "For the elect, I knew you before the foundations of this earth." That foundations is the catabol, the overthrow. But the very first chapter of Jeremiah, the book in which we're teaching now, God told Jeremiah, I knew you before you were even in the mother's womb. And while you were in the mother's womb, I ordained you as a pastor. I'm sorry, a prophet. And But also, you have... Um, the great book of Romans in chapter 8, beginning with verse 26, where God says, I have foreordained you. But why? Because he doesn't give somebody an order, a preordination if they don't earn it. So naturally, when Satan rebelled, they stood against him. There's no such thing as pre-existence because all souls have never ceased existing. But after the great lake of fire at the end, there will be some that will not. Ooh, we got some very small writing here. This would be Katrina from North Dakota. It has been so long since they were here before. Will the two witnesses have a problem with culture shock? Or will they arrive with cell phones and understand how to use them? The two witnesses do not need cell phones to communicate. Okay. The, uh, and as far as uh, culture shock, we are so far behind them. I mean, they have vehicles. We've got old fossil burning fuel uh, uh, jets and stuff that burn old fossil fuel. They have energy that we don't even know about, that uh, energy cells. And um, uh, they, uh, we are so far behind, they, they will not receive culture shock. If anybody receives culture shock, it'll be us because of their abilities, all right? Read uh, Revel Revelation chapter 11 at the power they have to do things, and then I think you'll have a better understanding of them as far as rain, fire, and blood is concerned. Uh, Joanne from Oklahoma. Pastor Murray, do, you, do the people on the other side come down from heaven and live in the millennium? Thank you. I'm privileged to belong to your church. Well, welcome aboard, Joanne. It's good to have you as a member of the church. Christ has approved you, and so do we. Um, the millennium is a time of teaching for people that never had an opportunity to learn the truth. There are also, in the flesh body, sometimes there are holdbacks, whether it be from health or injuries or whatever, that a person doesn't have the ability to put it all together. And besides, in these flesh bodies, and this is my statement, don't ask me to prove it scripturally because it's not there, but I feel in the flesh body we have about 10% of the ability of thought process that we have in the spiritual body. In other words, during the millennium in the spiritual body, there will be 100% recall. And at that time, you won't have to ask, this is scripture, you won't have to ask a neighbor if he knows the Lord's word, they'll know it. Okay. But it's discipline that they must be taught. And God is fair and understanding. He doesn't want to send someone into that lake of fire. If they take responsibility for themselves, but if they will not take responsibility for themselves, they deserve to go into the fire, the lake of fire. And God is that consuming fire. Lucille from Washington. I have a question for Pastor Murray. The Bible says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Do you have to be baptized to be saved? There, in our Father's plan, there are extenuating circumstances in many cases. Example, two thieves on either side of the Lord Jesus Christ at crucifixion. One thief was converted. He, he um, stopped the other. We deserve what we have, but this is the Son of God. And Jesus told him, this day I will see thee in paradise, meaning you've overcome. And he would be on the same side of paradise that Christ is. So therefore, 
Christ did not take him down from the cross and baptize him. So uh, baptism, though, should be done because Christ was our shepherd. Christ was baptized, and so should we be at the age of accountability. Dottie from Arkansas, please help. My mom, my, my name is Dottie, okay, I, from Arkansas. I pray you will read this letter on your program because I am of a loss at what to tell my sister. She gets so mad at me because she tells me not only are we praying to Satan when we pray to Jesus Christ, name, but we need to pray for Satan. She also says that God's uh, name is not Jesus, but that God's son is Michael the Archangel. That would, and his name is Jesus Michael. That is false. That is angel worship. Angel wor Michael is the angel of Israel. He is not the Christ of Israel. Besides, does she not know that Yeshua, Jesus, is Emmanuel, which means God with us, not some angel? Michael is a very good angel. But to worship him rather than the Christ is angel worship, and that's blasphemy against the Father of our, all of our people. Uh, again, there's nothing wrong. And you say, please help. You know, it sounds like that maybe she's out of, uh, in the millennium, you can help her. But do not cast your pearls before swine. Okay. You've, once you've planted it, if it doesn't grow, then uh, look forward to the millennium. Live the life that sets the example to her of God, uh, and be blessed by God where she will not be. Okay. Ruth from Minnesota. Question, why can't you let the new people know more often that when our dear Father forgives us that we still remember? When I first saw and started learning about the Bible, I believed and asked forgiveness, but also my memories were still there even though God forgave it, so I was confused. And then when I heard you say, we still remember so we know where we shouldn't go and how it felt to be a new person. Well, very good. When we do mention that pretty often, and so it is. You remember, and that is, that is pres uh, preservation and keeps us from committing the same junk all over again. Uh, Rob from Arizona. Uh, Pastor Murray, I have written you before, and here is another question. How to help the spiritually blind to see the truth. Well, you plant seeds, and you plant seeds from the Word of God, and, and, and you know, what does it mean in planting seeds? If you dump a whole uh, kettle on them, they're going to run. Okay. When you plant a seed, you take a tidbit, just like you fish for men, just like you fish for fish. You throw out a little thing and you jiggle and you you uh, encourage and then when they take that one seed then hook them okay but hook them with the truth the word of God and if they don't take the seed that means God's not ready for them to come over yet so you want to be very careful in that just plant a seed if it grow only God can make it grow if God doesn't make it grow you don't want to try to because you can't but God can, and sooner or later that'll take with them maybe, and they're going to come to you and ask further questions, plant more seeds. Uh, David from Wisconsin, uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, two years ago, you hit, well, he's been with us two years. I've got a question. The ark, uh, the ark, Lucifer is one of the cherubims guarding. Who was the other? It was probably Michael because he's the one that holds Satan. And, um, and so it is. Do you believe we'll occupy eternity for God's redemption? Well, of course. And uh, eternity is forever, and that's God's promise. Uh, okay, we've got um, 
Dolores from Arizona. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. The verses are referring to sleep and be watchful and don't go to sleep. Does that mean you can't go to sleep at night? Suppose you take medications that causes you to sleep. Doesn't mean that at all, okay? We're speaking spiritual here. It means you spiritually are a watchman. That means you watch current events and the events of this world and align that with biblical prophecy to know where you're at and what you're doing. But um, you get your sleep, you get your rest. It's not talking about that. You, know, you need your rest to function properly where you are a good watchman, okay? And um, God will always take care of you, all right? It means to be watchful because you are a watchman. Janet from Tennessee, I have been trying to find where God said, I am against those who teach my children to fly to save their souls. Well, it's real easy to find it. Ezekiel chapter 13, begin reading with verse 18 and 20, where it speaks to the daughters of Jerusalem. That's God's own people. Okay. He said, you sow kerchiefs and you cover every knuckle and joint of my outreach saving arms where God is the Savior, and teach my children to fly to save their souls, and I'm against it. So that kind of puts it down, doesn't it? I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Makes his day. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. You can count on it. He loves you, and uh, you bless him. He will always return that blessing and love. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me and you listen good. You stay in his word. Every day, in his word, even with trouble, I mean all kinds of trouble, still a good day. Do you know why? Because Jesus Yeshua is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The Epistles of John, three letters written by the Apostle John, that disciple whom Jesus loved. The tenderness of John's writings is marked by the number of times he begins the exhortations and warnings with, My little children, or little children. In fact, little children is written seven times in the first epistle alone. The contents of the first epistle are practical teaching in the light of the love of God. God is life, is light, is truth, is righteous, is love and we have fellowship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. The tenderness and love of John's writing continues in the second epistle as he encourages the elect lady and her children to love one another. 
He also writes, This is love, that we walk after his commandments, after these words of encouragement. John warns us that there are many deceivers entered into the world and explains how to identify these deceivers. Don't miss this opportunity to study the Epistles of John with Pastor Arnold Murray. From Gravit, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line, study in God's Word. Now, here's Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to get into a new study today, as you see there on your screen, War and Armor. It's a subject we did many, many, many years ago, and the old soundtrack kind of played out on it. So we're going to redo it, calling it the same thing, War and Armor. What kind of war are we going to be fighting here in these end times? And that's the war I'm talking about. The war...